Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our inspirational interview series. I'm Hannah Levin with Heartfelt Wellbeing, and I'm excited to bring to you another amazing, inspirational guest today, Kim Fuller. And I am going to read a little bit of her intro or an intro for her before we bring her on. And I just want to invite you, if you are here live, to feel free to chime in and engage. And if you're watching the replay, feel free to engage with that. Give us your, your comments. So Kim Fuller is a mindful photographer, meditation guide, author, TEDx speaker, and founder of Born to Rise. Her passion is to help women stand in their power, their story, and their beauty so they can live a confident and peaceful life. She uses photography to mirror the beauty she sees in each woman, empowering them to show up authentically in business and in life. So I'm excited to have Kim here with us today, and we'll bring her on. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So glad to have you here today. Thank you for yeah, joining thanks, us. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Thank you. Yeah. So I'd love for you to share a little bit more about your own journey and bringing what you've professionally cultivated into this this journey of supporting other women of, from your own personal experience as a photographer and mindfulness yeah. coach. Yeah. So um, photography has always been a way for me to connect with people. And I grew up a Navy kid, so we moved around a lot, but I really found that the camera was something that when pointed at someone was like an instant, um, sometimes connector and sometimes like, oh God, don't look like at a wall. Me. Right. It was a wall. So it was a really interesting sort of thing. But um, because I think I started young enough, you know, kids don't have quite the hangups that adults have about being photographed. And so it was a really, um, interesting and fun way to connect with people and get to know mm. people. Um, it was of course pre-digital, so they couldn't see their image right away. So it wasn't so, you know, I don't know, ego driven, but um, I just really love the process. And I come from a family of artists, so it just became my medium to create with. Mm. And over the years um, as an adult, um, I have a, I now have a photography business and have had for like 35 years always did portrait work. I just love, I love people. I'm very fascinated by people. I love to get in the minds of people and hear their stories, where they came from, what their thoughts are, you know, because I'm fascinated by how different we all think, even though we're living very similar lives sometimes. It, well, it appears that way. And so the photography has just been a continuation of really studying people and hearing their stories, but from a visual side. Um, mm -hmm. and as far as empowering the women, I think what I found to be so fascinating is that every time I start a photo session with a woman, particularly whether it's business or they're coming for an empowerment shoot or they need photos with their family, there's a lot of insecurity and over the process and the way that I set up the shoot and interact with them, they tend to relax and almost open up as if they start out as this tight little flower bud and then slowly emerge into this beautiful presence. And when I'm able to capture that part of it, they really love the photos and yeah. they almost have this sense of like, Oh my God, that's me. Like they're re-seeing yeah. a part of themselves that maybe was a little bit forgotten. Yeah. So t talk to us a little bit about that. Um, kind of inner dialogue that happens when we're in front of a camera? Oh, golly. I mean, I, I, I can't even imagine the individual comment, com you know, commentary for each person, but I yeah. think that it often starts with, how do I look? Mm -hmm. Is my, am I enough? Mm -hmm. Right. The, the bottom line with so much of this work that we're all doing is, am I enough? Yeah. Um, and that's different for everyone. Where are you coming from on that perspective? What kind of, uh, I guess, conditioning do you have around your self image? Mm -hmm. um, 
I was very fortunate to have parents who didn't talk a lot about like my weight or my mm -hmm. looks or whatever. I was able to express myself pretty fully. It wasn't a big thing or issue. Um, but I know that, you know, oftentimes women in particular hear their own mothers talking about their weight or their hair going gray or, you know, whatever that's not mm -hmm. quite right. And that gets taken in and absorbed by us. And mm -hmm. whether it was an intentional directed comment directly at us or just something that we heard. And it's just conditioning over decades of mm -hmm. women's beingness, right? And so we get in front of the camera and there's something that feels, I think, somewhat permanent about being mm -hmm. documented. Like, this is it. This is how people are going to see me. Mm -hmm. and it's really simply a moment in time, yeah. a very brief moment, right? <laughs> but there's something terrifying about it. And I think what starts to happen when I can just simply talk with someone and, and get into the joy of being, being seen mm -hmm. in their natural, authentic expression, there's something so wonderful that happens. And there's a little bit of more, more of that inner light that starts to shine and they start yeah. to relax and say, gosh, this isn't so bad. And when yeah. that can shine through and be documented, they love seeing that side of mm -hmm. them and realize it's not, it's not really about all that other junk I was worried about. Right. Yeah. I love that because there's, I think we have the conditioning part and I also feel so blessed that I grew up with a mother who was not, self-conscious about her weight or not, you know, never, both my parents never commented on, you know, how I looked or whatever, except my dad was always like, you don't need that stuff on your face. Like whenever I right, had my right. makeup, he'd be like, you're beautiful just the way you are. Take that stuff off your face. You know? But other than that, I, I grew up without, you know, diet culture or, a, you know, weighing on scale or whatever. And yet it's so pervasive in our culture, this drive towards thinness or to, you know, look a certain way or all these different things. And I think it's, it is like this pressure, whether we have it directly, like in our childhoods, in our home, it's, it's in the culture and the yeah. culture is like this, this box that's like, look this way, act this way. Right. And what I see in the work that I do with women too, is that that is so exhausting. It's so exhausting. Yes. And the people that we admire most in our lives are the people that are willing to step mm -hmm. outside the box. And yet all of us are like trying to fit in the box. It's this weird conundrum, right? So you're saying when these people <laughs> kind of say like, oh, I'll just be me or, you know, through interacting with you, this inner light comes out and there's not this like, oh, suck in your stomach or, you know, make your boobs look bigger or whatever it is that then it's just like you shining. That is so beautiful in a unique way and inspiring to other people, even the people who it's a picture of. Yeah. And I think one of the gifts that I've been blessed with in life is that I do see people through and through. It's not mm -hmm. just the exterior and I really like to meet, I'm, I'm good at meeting people where they are. So if someone comes to me and has a self-consciousness about a double chin or their stomach or what have you, I just kind of meet them there and I say, girl, I get you. I feel you up and down. Like nobody, you know, we all want to feel good in, yeah. in the way we look and all that. And I get that. Like, I want to feel good the way I look too. I'm all about clothes and I mess with my hair and I'm look, you know, want my skin to be good and all that stuff. And I think where we reach a point of it becoming a problem is when I guess it overtakes our life, but that doesn't mm -hmm. mean we can't sort of work with it, if you will. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'll meet a woman and say, here's a couple of tricks with double chins, or here's a couple of things with, you know, um, like if you twist your body, sometimes that really looks nice. Mm -hmm. on the photo. If you lean into the camera, it gets rid of the double chin. Like I love working with women and helping them feel good. Mm -hmm. but not obsessing about those details because I really right. think that when they can have fun and say like, even if they're leaning in that, that alone, just leaning into the camera has a sense of leaning into me yeah, into the experience. I mean, there's, it's very subtle little things, but 
I love when it shows up. And then yeah. they smile and they're, you know, we start laughing about it. But I think that idea of really meeting them where they are without judgment is what softens the experience and helps them relax. Mm -hmm. And then yes. we laugh and I capture those. And, you know, I, I know for me, like when I see myself laughing, I just, that makes me feel good. Yeah. Yeah. So also, I love that you oh, go ahead. No, you I should just say also on the other side of that coin, I worked with a woman who I photograph regularly for her business and she had gained quite a bit of weight compared to her, what her normal weight had been through most of mm -hmm. her life. And we did a photo shoot together and it was like she was seeing how she had let herself go in more ways than just her weight. It was mm -hmm. sort of like this trigger for how much she had stopped exercising, stopped being mindful of what she put in her mouth. Like she was eating mm -hmm. a lot of junk food. Um, she was working too hard. It was all these things. And she actually thanked me in some way for just taking the pictures. But mm -hmm. when she looked at them, it was sort of the kickstart she needed to reassess her overall life. Mm -hmm. and I thought in some way, like, that's kind of neat too. Yeah. So yeah. there's lots of ways like check -in. that photo shoots can be empowering. Yeah. And I love that you call them empowerment photo shoots because it's like the experience of it creates empowerment. So it's not yeah. just like, oh, I need to get some pictures taken for headshots for my business or whatever. It's like that experience is transformational. And then you also get pictures, right? <laughs> like, right. And, and that, funny, they're like, they don't even care if they see the pictures after the right. end of it. You're like, that was so much fun, right? Yeah. And so <laughs> it's great. It's it's a good feeling. Yeah, that's totally awesome. Yeah. Um, I, I found too, so I was a photography major undergrad um, and and I've found, yeah, that people, when, when you take their picture, it's kind of like there's this um, like uh, awareness that comes in um, and and that can be, um, yeah, interesting as you were saying, like it can be like a moment of pride or it can be like, oh, please don't, you know, capture this or, yeah. you know, whatever. Um, and, and yet it is like, um, I think as we've transitioned from, I also worked with film, <laughs> you know, in a dark room. And so as we've transitioned away from pictures being kind of like we choose what gets printed to like everything's available on a computer or a phone, right. um, it becomes less and everything is editable now, right? So well, we can edit. That's a whole other layer, right? Because yeah. what we see online, um, yes. particularly with, with um, models in magazines, which is what we all kind of started with to now social media, to influencers, to all, and the celebrities that we see, there's a lot of work that goes into to curating these right. photo shoots, the hair, the makeup, the outfits, the whole thing. And I don't think we realize that. And it's funny because yeah. I heard, when I first got out of uh, art school, I went and assisted with a photographer for a while and we occasionally had models come in and it was my first experience really working with fashion and fashion mm -hmm. models. I was blown away at the pulling, the tugging, the nipping and the tucking and the hair and the, and this poor girl by the end of our day looked exhausted and was mm -hmm. almost like a piece of meat. But there was mm. so much that went into making her look the way they wanted her to look for yeah. the shoot that, that, like you said, it's exhausting. Yeah. And so yeah. we have to realize that those people come in not looking like that. Yeah. And, even the social media with the filters and the skin right. enhancers or whatever we're doing, um, it's false. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so take us, us. <laughs> yeah. So take us on a journey because you have this background in photography, but then you also have come into being a practitioner and teacher of mindfulness. Yeah. And you've had a journey of more of like a truth seeking. Oh yeah that's very different from like right. making things look a certain way. That's um, right. I know photography can be truth or not, but, yeah. um, but that's also our minds, right? We have right. a mind that can be making up all kinds of things mm -hmm. right? versus being present and looking at reality in the here and the now. Right. So this wonderful paralleling of what 
I do with both businesses. But basically what started for me was being on a photo shoot where I was caught up in my own ego, actually, and my own mind thoughts and my inner narrative, um, where the Dalai Lama was going to be speaking at Salve Regina University here in Newport, mm -hmm. Rhode Island. And I was assigned to document the event. And in my ego mind, I was like, well, I'm the head photographer. I get to walk around, get all the great shots, get pictures of people's faces. And long story short, I was told I have to sit in a seat at the last second. You're not allowed to even get up. And I thought, well, that's boring. And that's going to be this and that. And like I was making up all kinds of things. What ended up happening without getting into that whole story is that because I was where I was in my seat, I ended up shaking his hand as he came into the tent. He paused and shook many hands, but did also do mine. And I might have that happen if I had been moving around and doing all these things. In the moment of shaking his hand, I had a very transformative something happen. It was as, as if pure love had held me in that moment. And I was so fascinated by what happened and so moved that I, I literally cried and just mm -hmm. broke into tears. And then I thought, what, what was that? And started to study Buddhism and really listen to his talk and hear about it. And it made a lot of sense for me. That experience was amazing. Got into meditation and mindfulness. Didn't know what I was doing. There's not a lot of monks around to help guide me, but I read a lot and, you know, was a seeker. Then um, met a young boy who we ended up adopting into our family who really became my greatest spiritual teacher. He was very present, he was very raw, very honest, and it was the hardest thing I've ever been through in my life. Mm. It really taught me about patience, compassion, empathy, all the foundations of the Buddhist um, practices. That really got me even more interested in how powerful my mind is, and I'm sure everyone else's mind, when we work with it. Mm. And I realized the inner narrative and dialogue that I would often have show up without me even knowing that it was showing up and how much it directed me throughout my day. And that when I was able to harness that a little bit and really notice it and say, wait a second, that's not really true, or that's not what I want to be happening or thinking, then I was able to change my actions. And mm -hmm. so it became a very powerful practice in raising this child, especially and also helping him work with his mind that was in a heightened state of chaos because of his early mm -hmm. traumas. And he had beliefs about himself that were awful. You know, talk about self-confidence and the lack of and feeling abandoned and unlovable. And uh, he felt badly about his actions and, you know, all of these things that it was a very helpful set of tools that I had to also help guide him into shifting his mindset. So mm -hmm. it was just um, an amazing experience. But I ended up writing a book about our journey together, ended up um, doing a TED talk about it, which was the most incredible experience because it gave me an opportunity to shift my story, right? Mm -hmm. The all that kind of what felt like bad stuff, bad parenting and awful yelling and screaming that was going on and all these things that I felt a little bit of shame around. I was able to really look at that and see where I was now and, and change that story from uh, a negative thing to something quite beautiful and powerful. And in writing it, transforming it and sharing it was an incredible experience. Born to Rise came from that, that, that experience that I felt more women would benefit from by sharing their personal stories out loud. There's a lot of writing programs. There's a lot of you know people writing their stories and I love that. But there's something about standing up in front of people and telling it that scares the you know what out of you. And when it's out there, it's so freeing and you feel the support of the other women who are there to hear you and be inspired and listen and share. And it's a really compassionate way to connect. So that's how yeah. this came about. That's so awesome. And I think that goes back to the question that you um, said, like all of us are living on some level is, am I enough? Yes. And when we tell our stories and people hear our stories and go, wow, or like, whoa, right? like whatever <laughs> the the reaction is, it, it, it helps us be seen in our enoughness. 
Yes. Right? That yes. There's a common, <laughs> like, yeah, we're all enough. And we all have these stories, but yes, a lot of times they don't get told. Yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, Brene Brown, right, all about the vulnerability. And that's really what, what it's about is standing in that vulnerable place of being seen, which is mm-hmm. what I see in the photography as well as the story sharing. So yeah. it's been a wonderful journey. Yeah, that's it's so incredible. Can can you say a little bit more about um, the work with Born to Rise, like how people come to be able to tell their stories or how that's shared? So it's a very new business. We basically started right before COVID. So um, it started with a the idea to have a women's story festival. And um, so I started having many events like i said i you know i'll gather some women to to come to a storytelling like just get some locals to come and and we'll see you know what that's like and people can see what a fest a festival what might be like you know if they came well i sold out the first event with 60 women which was all the room could hold and it blew me away that there was so much interest and i was very excited mm-hmm. by that of course so essentially what i do is i um i invite usually three women to share a 15 minute or less story about a transformative moment and aha that they had um something they experienced and learned from um and speaking from the heart so it's not scripted they don't read something um and so we gather we come with the intention to listen to these women and what is so powerful is the feedback you get and the the celebration of someone literally just standing up there even if they're shaking in their boots Mm rattling on and you got to wave them down and go, you know, time (laughs) because people get lost in it and scared and nervous and all that. But some of the stories that come out of it are profound. Um, Mm -hmm. And then we have the the annual story festival, which is a a bigger thing and um, a little bit more curated with storytellers, but the storytellers are all pretty raw. You know, some people are natural born, stand in front of people and feel comfortable and others are shaking in their boots. It doesn't really matter. We encourage it all. I don't always know what they're going to talk about. I have mm-hmm. a theme typically, but I'm always overwhelmed and surprised by by what comes out of their mouths. And uh, it, it's a super fun thing. And so far, we're just in Rhode Island, but I'm hoping that we can create more experiences outside of Rhode Island. In the mm. Yeah. And then I have some programs where we, um, a program called Soul Pilots, which is a more of a a deep dive into our spiritual well-being. Um, And so we address everything from loving yourself to being in relationship with others and and how to rid yourself of um, any fears you might have. And so you can really do the things that you want to do, are talented at, have gifts around, and that need to be shared in the world. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, Mm -hmm. that's the work we do in my programs too about around Dharma. Like, what are we here for? Like, yeah. Get rid yeah. of the stuff that's holding us back. And like, right. What? Why are you here in this life? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so, so awesome. So um, would you be willing to share a short um, mindfulness or yeah, meditation practice with us along yeah, these lines to. of what you, what you teach? Yeah. And how, how much time do I have? Um, five ish minutes. We can go a little bit longer if you want to. Sure. I think I'll just do, um, a little guided settling in, um, around the body because we all have body things, right? (laughs) So if you're comfortable closing your eyes, I'll just invite you to close your eyes. I'm going to close mine. It just helps me go inward. If not, feel free to just gaze down at something on the desk and use it as your point of focus. And just start with the breath, just noticing how the air enters the nostrils, your nostrils. Have you ever even even thought about the shape of your nostrils, the nose hairs in your nostrils? and how beautifully they function every moment as you breathe in and out. Mm. 
And if we chose, we could literally rest right here. Simply having gratitude for our nostrils, that space that allows air that we all breathe to come in and to go out. This life force that we bring into our bodies through these two holes in our nose. Can we love that little part of ourselves as a place to start? And we feel ourselves sitting in this body, maybe noticing our legs on our chair or our feet on the floor. What is the sensation there? Our senses provide us with present moment experiences, this place of sensation where air enters the body. We feel tingling on the skin. We feel a vibration in the ears as we hear something. We taste something in the mouth. We learn to love, <clears throat> excuse me, we love our bodies for its functionality, as simple as this place of our nostrils on the end of our nose that creates space for our life force, breath, oxygen to come into the body. To help us move, hug, think, create, share our gifts, just these two little nostrils. So let's take a dig, be, big deep breath in those two little holes. When you're ready, just open your eyes. And slowly take in where you are. And that's just a silly little meditation, but it's just a way to think about the body and all of its parts and all how we, we sometimes get overwhelmed with the whole not being enough, you know, um, or it's to this or it's to that, or this looks wrong, or this is, you know, not working right. But finding gratitude for <clears throat> this physicalness, this body, this container that we move through the world in mm -hmm. and that our minds and all the thoughts we have are able to come out as actions when we align those two things and um, show up, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. You're welcome. Yeah. I like to be playful. I like to, I really like to not get too, too serious or, you know, like bring some of that in once in a while. So, hey, our nostrils are kind yeah. of fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it really, I think, brings us to the awareness of like focusing on what's working or yeah. what's going well, right? Absolutely. Instead of we have a tendency to focus on threats or perceived threats or what's not right in our minds or what what we think is wrong and so yeah when we just slow down we're like my nostrils that's so nice they're yeah. receiving and releasing breath from my body i'm so grateful for that it changes our perspective and our physiology our yeah. stress chemistry decreases so it's especially very, if you have a cold yeah right? like we notice right away like oh they're not working so great today Right. And, you know, remembering the impermanence of all things that yeah. they don't, they work right now, but maybe not tomorrow. And can we have gratitude for where we are right now? Mm. Yes. And how important at this time in our world too. 
Oh, so important. So key. Yeah. Well, Kim, thank you so much for joining us today. Really great oh for your support and your well, sharing. And I, I hope that um, we will stay connected. I think we will. Yes, I think so too. Thank you so much. And we'll post your um, your link with this with this interview. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Yes. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.